Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Julio Capo Jr. and I'm the Deputy Director of the WPHL. Um, and welcome to our second Miami Studies Workshop, Our Stories FIU, Storytelling Through Sound and Image. I am so, so, so excited for this. Um, let me just briefly introduce our two presenters today, um, and then I will be very excited to just learn so much more about this incredible project. Um, Enrique Rosel is the project uh, program manager, excuse me, at the WPHL, where he supports and helps plan events and programming around FIU and the broader South Florida community. Uh, he works closely with many of the, the, the WPHL's many community partners. In his free time, Enrique is a talented musician and photographer, super, super talented. I've had the pleasure of seeing so much of this, um, who has given workshops at the FIU Frost Art Museum regarding photographic storytelling and film development. And Dr. Andrea Fanta is Associate Professor of Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages at FIU and a WPHL faculty fellow. She's the author of the 2015 book, Residios de Violencia, Producción Cultural Colombiana del Fin del Siglo, and co-editor of the 2017 book, Territories of Conflict, Traversing Colombia Through Cultural Studies. Um, and she's also the co-PI in this NEH funded grant to build a Miami Studies program that we're all part of here today. Together, Enrique and Andrea co-lead Our Stories, a photographic and reflective undergraduate student-based project and podcast series that documents student stories during the COVID-19 pandemic through the lens of disposable cameras and written reflections. So with that, thank you. Enrique, can you move me to the- Yeah, okay? yeah no problem, no problem. Hello, everyone, while I go ahead and do that. Thank you all so much for coming. I see some familiar faces in the participants uh, tab. Pioneer, it's been so long, hello. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. So we're super excited to speak with you all today about our project and about just storytelling when it comes uh, to sound and image and podcasting. So if you've been curious about how to start a podcast, maybe how, like starting your own podcast, whether it's uh, personally or through your department. Um, this will also be a good resource for that as well. This will be up on our YouTube channel as well. Um, but obviously, if you have any questions, you can always email email us. Um, we actually have a, an email, stories at fiu.edu. You can also email me at eroselle at fiu.edu uh, with any questions afterwards, you know, for anything that you'd like in Andrea as well. We can put all of our contact information in the chat. Um, but without further ado, we do have a lot to go over today, and we actually do have an activity at the end. So if you have a piece of paper near you, or if you have um, so like a, your phone, you can also do it on your phone, where you're going to need to write down something a little bit later um, in the conversation. But um, we'll get started. So like Julio said, you know, with such a nice introduction, my name is Enrique Rosell. I'm the program manager at the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. And then we have Andrea. And I'm Andrea Fanta, Associate Professor of Latin American Literature and Culture, and also a proud uh, WPHL's faculty fellow. Exactly. We're super happy to be here. Um, so just jumping straight into it, you know, what is the Our Stories Project? Julio uh, mentioned a little bit about it earlier. Um, so this is kind of like our main, uh, our main um, thumbnail for all of our podcasts and marketing for the Our Stories Project. Um, so a little bit about it, actually, if I click over here, you all can see this, right? Can you see this, Andrea? This um, yes, I can. The website. Okay, perfect. Hopefully, everyone can see that in the chat. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, everyone can see that. Perfect. So I see Laura is here as well. She also has been helping with this project. You'll see her picture in a second. But just a little bit of a rundown of the project. It's an intimate and vulnerable look into the lives of our students during the the historic summer um, of summer 2020. But we've been continuing it uh, further. So everything that you see on this website is going to be from students. Um, from summer 2020. So really the middle of the pandemic, kind of like really the worst part of it. Um, but we are currently finishing up um, interviews with our second cohort of students uh, for, from spring 2021. So earlier this year, um, their pictures were taken around March and, um, and uh, the reflections were also written around March, April. And now we're, we've been interviewing them um, uh, now and that's gonna be posted soon on this website as well. So you can see all of this at ourstories.fiu.edu. Um, but like we said, we just really, this idea came about after speaking with Andrea and Rebecca, we were trying to figure out um, a way to help students tell their stories and kind of archive and collect, uh, create an oral history of uh, the pandemic through the eyes of our students. We chose to do it through film as well. Um, so the Our Stories Project is 
pretty much like I would consider like a pretty perfect marriage between oral, oral, um, well, audio and visual storytelling, um, and uh, audio and yeah, or um, audio and visual storytelling. So basically, the reason we chose film is also number one. I'm just a huge, I'm a huge advocate for film photography. I'm crazy about it. You should see my room. My dad says it looks like a pawn shop, um, but. Um, also, we really kind of wanted to mimic the uncertainty um, of the moment of the pandemic and that summer and kind of like our lives during this time and how, you know, the students are taking these images, but they're not able to see what those images look like. You don't know what they're going to look like two weeks from now. You don't know what's going to. And they also have to like think about what they're going to be taking, what images are going to be taking. They had a certain time span. So it was like, do you wait, you know, and take the images now? Do you wait until later? So it kind of mimicked the uncertainty of the time and the way that we, you know, we're not able to see two weeks into the future, a day into the future. We don't know what the next day is going to look like. And especially during that summer, it was pretty particularly turbulent. So it was a great time. It was also a it's also a collaboration with the Honors College. Um, while I was in the Honors College there as the program coordinator, which has been a great time. And we're and all of our students here are also um, honors students, most of them. And on the second cohort as well, most of them are also honor students, which is which has been really cool. Um, but our students, you know, they they so they take these images, they write written reflections after they see their images, which is also very interesting because they see them after a good amount of time. So Sometimes it would take like maybe like a month between them finishing their images and actually seeing their images between development and scanning for them to actually see their images. So it separated the students from that. And then they wrote a, re a reflection about their uh, about their images and their emotions during that that time period. So a lot of, uh, you know, we covered a lot of topics like mental health, uh, being stuck in different countries away from their families for some of our international students, activism during COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter pandemic. Uh, the 4th of July in 2020, uh, what the first few months of quarantine were like, like I mentioned, the Black Lives Matter protests, um, and a whole bunch of more, a whole bunch more uh, topics. And it, it was very, um, very emotional, to be honest. And you all see, you'll all see a, a little bit of what we're talking about in a second. Uh, but yeah, I also do want to mention a huge thank you to the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center for helping make this project happen to help fund some of our cameras and, and development, which has been great. And obviously the, the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab. Laura, huge shout out to Laura as well. And Rebecca that was on here earlier. They were also a huge help in making this project happen and, and uh, making sure that we get to where we are today and push forward. So if you go on the website, uh, you can click over here and see all of our students. And like I said, this is all gonna be updated with our, our spring cohort. So we have um, all of our students who participated in the project in the, in the first cohort of the project. Um, you can click on any of these when you go to Moments Captured. So if you want to see, for example, if you want to see Emily's images, you know, you can go to Emily's images and see there, there was a learning curve, which was also very interesting to hear them reflect on in their in their images and in their um, and in their podcast, because at a certain point, you know, they were like, you know, you, you, you get what you get. And you kind of deal with it, you know, similar to what they were going through in the pandemic as well. And even though those images, some of the images maybe weren't perfect, um, they still loved them because of what they represented, right? So it was a, it was a pretty interesting um, dynamic. So you can check out all of the images here from all of the students. There was a 27 images tops. You can read the reflections here as well um, about their, their time in the pandemic, or you can listen to the podcast. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, um, Amazon Music, Spotify, or straight through our website. So you can listen to any of them here. This is a little, I can play a little, a little preview of, um, of the podcast, actually. Where is it? Uh, perfect timing. I'm here, an introduction to it. Welcome to the podcast series, Our Stories, Summer 2020. I'm Enrique Roselle, the student program coordinator at the Honors College at FIU. And I'm Andrea Fanta, faculty fellow at the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab, also at FIU. Our story, summer 2020, is a photo. Well, I won't play the whole thing because because we're we're going over it for the sake of time. But we also have transcripts and everything. So that's pretty much a rundown of the actual website. We also do have a book that you can take a look at. So if you want to kind of see this. Um, you know, if you want to buy the book, you know, feel free to do so. You totally don't have to. Um, but it's a physical copy of what the what the uh, the summer represents. So we thought it was very important to do so. It contains like a little bit about what the project is, the reflections of each student. They all picked their favorite image as well from their uh, their group, and then also we picked a, a few of our favorites from each student, and uh, and uh, collected them here in this in this book. So going back to the presentation. 
a little bit about about uh, everything else. So like I said, we're really creating a storytelling archive here uh, where we're trying to document the human experience and the experience of our students during the pandemic um, through an audiovisual digital archive. Um, so like I mentioned before, this is kind of like the the rundown and the um, the way that we we are conducting this project. So we have 27 photographs. Each student has two weeks to take the pictures on a disposable camera. So, and we've seen that limiting the students to this digital cam this uh, disposable camera and only 27 images has been really interesting um, to see the way that they cope with that and, and cope with only not being able to see their images. And also like they get really creative, you know, and they, and they figure things out differently using this disposable camera. So they tell their story in a different way, which has been cool to see. Um, then, like I mentioned, they write the written reflection. Uh, 500 words is typically the, the tops. So um, we have students um, that write about that. And we, we train them before, um, I, when we pick a new cohort, we train them about, you know, writing um, calmly and writing for audio. And we talk to them about taking these images and how to use the camera. So we go through it so they're prepared. Um, reflecting voice recording. So we um, we sit down and record their actual reflect, uh, reflection um, that we play at the beginning of every podcast. So if you listen to any of the podcasts, if you go on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you look up Our Stories FIU, um, if you listen to any of the episodes, um, we start off with the student reading their reflection um, and then we go into the interview. So you'll be able to actually hear everything that the student had to say from, from their, own, uh, their own words. Um, then we interview them and, um, and um, Andrea and I typically interview them um, about kind of like what they've been doing and what their experience was taking the images, what their summer was like, how their feelings have changed. Um, and then we, we have uh, posted everything up on our website. That's kind of like serving right now as like a little bit of our digital archive and it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow soon uh, by the end of the semester. Um, and then Andrea, if you want to jump in here. I think one of the most interesting things about this project Although when, when we think about an audio visual uh, project, usually both the audio and the visual work in a synchronous way. And you can think in a movie, for example, right? Even if you cannot hear, you can see that the person is talking. So there's a synchronicity between image and sound. And one of the things that we tried to do was break that uh, synchronicity with an allowing time to elapse between the image and the sound. And that's what's gonna help the students develop um, like a reflective uh, practice. And that's where the, the, um, their reflection comes from, right? Because they have, been, they, have, they have had time to think about their images, to think about their lives, to think about their experience. And then it's then the, they sit down and write their reflection, and that's when we record them and we record their voice, which is important because it's a it's a personal account. Totally. We believe that this project has worked uh, worked by resisting instant gratification. And that means that the students are not able to uh, modify the pictures that they take or co take copious amount of pictures, but they have a set amount, 27. And they their, their viewing is obviously delayed by the time it takes uh, for us to develop the film. We encourage the reflective, the reflective practices using the writing assignments and the interview and also the time that elapses between the, the the time that they take the pictures until the time that they see them. And we're offering also first personal person accounts and reflections um, of our students, both during the summer 2020 and also the spring 2021 that we're collecting right now. Totally. Uh, before we get into this, one thing, one thing I will also add that I think is really interesting about the project is that I we feel like um, it's been promoting kind of photography and the use of this as like a viable storytelling um, um, vessel, really, with all of our students. A lot of the students that I've done um, have been a part of the Our Stories project, whether it's for summer or or spring, have started their own mini projects within their friend groups. Some of them have taken trips and bought their friends disposable cameras and made them write reflections um, or have bought their own camera to keep doing this. So it's been interesting and really nice seeing students um, enjoy the project so much that they implement it in their, their daily lives. And, and at the core of all this, these are really, you know, classic Miami stories from 
from students who have lived here their whole life or international students or are part of the Miami diaspora. So it's been really, really um, interesting hearing um, the way that they interact with the city and have interacted with the city during the pandemic or like during uh, the spring 2020 um, session where we were kind of coming out of the pandemic, you know, quote unquote, but people were getting vaccinated. People were starting to you know, come out of their of of their homes a little bit more. So it's it's also been interesting, and I think you'll all find it interesting when you when you hear the summer in, interviews and then you hear the spring interviews and kind of how different they are, um, but also how similar they still are as well, since we're still in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but then we wanted to talk about this image really quickly. Um, this is one of my favorite images I think any of the students have taken. Um, I love all of the images, but I really like this one. And we wanted to ask you. You can put it in the chat if you'd like. Um, what you think the story behind this image might be, or what do you think the student was trying to convey in this in this image? We'll give you a little bit, a little bit of time. Celebrating a birthday without family. Yeah, that's that's a pretty that's a good one. I don't know. This this image definitely gives me gives me chills you know just kind of looking at it it's uh it's very somber pioneer winter alone together love that celebrating a birthday with someone who has passed yeah. away with their favorite food yeah who passed away yeah mm -hmm. pretty much hitting the nail on the head there i really love this image for a lot of reasons number one like you said you know it's it you know it's underexposed but what, what i think it, it kind of like like um it kind of helps the image like storytelling uh the storytelling of this image i think it kind of helps it it's a little bit underexposed so it's darker there's a little bit of a green undercast to it uh we see the 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 cardboard cutout that says happy birthday dad we miss you the dad is obviously not there but there's a hot dog in front of in front of his empty chair um it's slightly off center so it looks like it's maybe like a spur of the moment photo or kind of mimicking also like the the sporadic nature of the moment or whatever they may be going through there's one hand holding up you know the cardboard cut out in the empty chair um i see our better hot dogs it's a beautiful photo and our better also you know like like julio pointed out our better is a is a miami staple you know so it's like a really big miami landmark almost you know on bird road so it's also interesting seeing them you know like i said earlier interact with the city itself um and then Orin put the human faces cropped out of the image, accentuating the sense of isolation. Exactly, exactly. I love that point as well. That's typically like a no-no when it comes to photography, right? Is like like cutting off someone's someone's head in a picture, um, but used in this way, you know, to tell this story, it definitely adds to it as well. I'd say. So you all you all really got it, but I'd love you to hear from the actual student who who took this image. It was Wenju Chen. She was incredible. And she actually spoke about this. And Andrea and I wanted you to kind of like see the way that that when you framed that moment um, through her image, you know, the way that she told that story through that image. But then we also wanted to hear the way that she wanted you to hear the way that she kind of accentuated that to us auditorily. So let me. Hey, everybody. And, put and I also take pictures. It's a one that we really, really liked. So. Looking back at your at your images, they look really reflective and emotional from from my perspective, from our perspective, you know, and, and we love that, you know, they're really reflective. And we wanted to ask about a few in particular. So could you tell us the story behind the picture of the birthday at our betters? Really, really love that picture. And also the picture of the woman looking looking at the trees from the apartment balcony. Um, why were these moments important for you to capture? And what emotions are they conveying that you connect with and have possibly experienced throughout, you know, throughout this turbulent summer? Um, part of my project or anything that I produce or make, I always want to include others. And it's a way for me to show my appreciation and thank people for being in my life. The picture at the hot dog place, um, a great friend of mine, his dad passed away on New Year's Day this year. So he had been grieving and struggling with his dad's passing. Um, and one of their traditions was to go eat at this hot dog place on his birthday every year. So for this year, um, since it was the first year his dad was in here, I decided to 
try to do something for him to make it not as sad. So I uh, did a cutout of a stick figure, wrote happy birthday, dad. Um, and I surprised my friend by putting the cardboard cutout next to him on the seat. And it says happy birthday, dad. And I took the photo of that moment because my friend didn't, had no idea that I was gonna do that. He cried and he said, this is very sweet. Thank you for doing this. And it Yeah, so we'll stop it there. So obviously, absolutely heartbreaking, right? Um, when I first saw this image, especially during, you know, the middle of the pandemic, I thought like, immediately you know and and i think that's also like saying kind of like what this what this project entails you know the, the context of this taking place in summer 2020 you know um immediately i thought that maybe this was covid related right we can hear from the reflection and well from the the podcast interview that that it was it was not due to covid it was it was before covid um but just just being this like being a part of this project um and uh taking this image during the time of the pandemic you know, can almost take on a whole different meaning, right? This can, this is about, you know, Wenju's friend's dad, but it also kind of reflects um, the story of so many people during the pandemic and during summer 2020, you know? So it kind of becomes something bigger than itself. This image almost becomes a bigger story than just the the specific one that Wenju said in the context of this project and, and the summer itself. So I think it's beautiful. And I think that's that's one of my favorite things about this project and and uh, and why we do it. So we'll move forward from here. So why is podcasting important in a university setting now? And I'll pass it on over to Andrea. They've been tracking and um, doing some uh, surveys about uh, the users and uh, listeners of podcasts. I believe it, it has been like four years now that they have been tracking uh, all of, they have a lot of data about it. And Enrique, if you can pass the slide, please. One of the things that found they found out, and this was during 2019, is that people listen to podcasts for two reasons. One is to learn new things, and the other one is to be entertained. So who hits the nail on those two criteria? Basically, it's the academic setting. So in a way, I think we, we need to be really, um, taking a look into this possible genre in order to express what, what's happening in academia, not only to, for, for knowledge to stay in academia, but really knowledge to go further into the public realm. And I think podcasting would be a, a, a fabulous way to, to, to do this. On the, this year's, uh, it's called the Infinite Dial. Um, the company or the yeah the institution that tracks uh, the usage uh, or the listeners um, for podcasts and one of the things they found out this year as you can see in this slide it says the demographics of podcast listeners continue to diversify in 2021 the composition of female listeners reached an all-time high while podcast consumers continue to be mostly white, the medium exhibited very strong gains with Hispanic and Latino listeners and with black listeners and now very nearly reflects the diversity of the US population. So basically, I think where our university and our institution is, is positioned perfectly in order to um, create this digital content for our own population and to target the population that our university serves. Totally. So now that you know that, you know, it, I think it's it's a really good idea. And I think that it's crucial for us to start podcasts, whether it's through our departments academically um, or personally, you know, what would you need to actually do? So I think this is like the number one question that we always get, you know, like, um, what do you need? What equipment do you need? Um, everybody thinks that they need like the fanciest equipment to do this. And I'm here to tell you that you totally do not. OK, so there's a couple different things that you could a couple different ways that you can approach actually starting your own podcast. So this is from the website RSS. Um, so here are a quick seven steps to starting a podcast, and then I'll go over actual equipment. 
Um, so number one, to find your niche or know your audience. So whether that is um, a specific niche that you're going after or your specific uh, student group, you know, just understand what their what their dream, not their dreams are, what what their uh, what their needs are. OK, and what they're what they would like to get out of that podcast or or uh, what they're looking for as students. Um, number two, create episode subjects. So what do you want to talk about per episode? Um, with our project, it was a little bit different just because it was kind of like based on what the students wanted to talk about or what their experiences were. Um, but with other podcasts I've done, we definitely, you know, covered different subjects or outlined different subjects that we wanted to hit hit uh, during the season of the of the of the podcast. Number three, uh, pick your your format and hosting style. So this is, you know, do you want to have two people interviewed? Do you want to have four people interviewed? Do you want to? Are you going to do it alone? Are you going to be interviewing other people? You know, so kind of defining what that what that setup is going to look like. Um, and keeping that consistent. So, you know, I think consistency is, is, is very key when it comes to podcasting, whether it's consistent uploading or just consistency when it comes to what the actual episodes sound and look like. Uh, number four, uh, get the right equipment, which we'll go over in one second. Number five, record. OK, so uh, pick a solid name for your show. So definitely think about what that like what you're naming your show, what it's representing, uh, marketing materials. Um, keep it short and sweet, which is something that I struggle with. A lot of my podcasts are like an hour long, which I think is typical. But, um, you know, I think uh, I think it's beneficial to keep it as short as possible. Uh, you know, like 30 minutes ish, I think is a good time. Um, number six, turn your recording into a podcast. So, you know, design artwork or buy artwork, you know, whether it's from Fiverr or from external relations or if you make it on your own, you know, you get some like eye catching artwork for people to uh, to see and want to tune in write the description. And this is all going through your podcast host site, which I'll explain in a second. So, you know, uploading your artwork, um, uploading your description, all of that is going through your podcast host site. Okay. And then number seven, large, launch and market your show. So developing a, a marketing plan, post on social media, post transcripts, which I think is a big thing uh, for students to, to keep track of for, or for, to be, for, for your podcast to be as accessible as possible. And then record more episodes and keep going. Um, when it comes to actual equipment you may need, um, this is what I, what I use and what we use with Andrea and what I've used in different podcasts, but there's multiple different ways and different configurations that you can use to actually start a podcast. Um, but I think this is this is pretty simple for myself. Um, so a microphone or an, and an audio box or an audio recorder. So I use a microphone and an audio box. So what you see down here is an actual audio box and there's a microphone. Um, I'll show you real quick, uh, like micro, uh, like um, recording bundle audio box, right? So there's like some bundles out there that are not too expensive that you can take a look into and buy and buy if you want to start something like this. You know, it's got it comes with headphones, pretty much everything you need to get started. Headphones, microphone, audio box that provides like phantom power to your microphone to power it, cables to connect to your laptop. Um, and the actual recording equipment, right? So that's that's pretty good, you know, for 239, that's not bad, right? So you can pretty much just jump into it, but that's what I meant by this when it comes to microphone and audio box. Um, but people also use like roadcasters and different like handheld um, recorders that you can take onto the field that also uh, cost about, about the same, that you can plug different headphones in. I know we own a couple as a part of WPHL. And you can, if you're, kind of more on the go or if you know your podcast is going to be a little bit more mobile that's a good option as well um for you to take that anywhere and you can literally record like out in the middle of a forest because it's saving that directly onto a onto a usb of the actual roadcaster uh, right so there's different options and and if you have questions you know you can always email me and we can talk about that so headphones like i mentioned so you can actually listen you and your guests can listen to you know what you're recording um and you can actually be kind of like uh concentrated on the actual podcast a uh, laptop with Zoom capability. So this is another thing that might be um that might be that might change for you. So Andrea and I have have done you know all of these these interviews through Zoom just for um number one for convenience, but number two because of you know the pandemic that is currently happening. So while we were recording this podcast, the first cohort, especially the so the summer 2020 cohort, we literally couldn't see anybody. I I've, I've met Andrea one time in person, which is still crazy to me, uh, right? Because we talk so often, but um. So that's why we decided to do it through Zoom. We even, you know, mailed um, students the cameras, you know, um, in envelopes. We, we weren't able to like hand it to them or them come visit our offices. So Zoom has been, you know, our best friend. We're looking to uh, we're looking through a couple different um, recording options that we've seen um, online as well. 
um, that would make it pretty easy to record podcasts virtually like this. But if you're looking for like a very simple, easy way, you can do it through Zoom. It's really not a big deal. If you record um, through Zoom and you record to the cloud, all you have to do is log into your Zoom account and you'll have the recording there in multiple different versions and the transcript. So if you if you do record on Zoom, my number one tip is record to the cloud because then you'll get the transcript, you'll get the video version, you'll get just the audio. So it'll be really easy to, to do so. Uh, number number three, four, artwork and branding, like I said. So just coming up with, um, you know, whether it's an image or whether it's a logo or whatever you might come up with, just some sort of cohesive branding that you can use on social media and uh, for your thumbnails. Um, a host site, so a podcast host site. So like I mentioned, so a host site, you know, since the podcast episodes are so dense, um, you're going to need something basically to just to host your actual podcast, right? So similar to the way that, you know, when you, if you've ever had to make a website, whether it's through Squarespace or, or through um, WordPress, right? You can't just like kind of start a website, right? You have to have a site that holds your website. So similar concept with, uh, with podcasts. So we use Podbean. I've used a few different podcast host sites and Podbean has been my favorite. Uh, we pay like, I think it's like uh, $15 a month, which is the equivalent of like, um, well, then we ended up upgrading. To, we pay like $100 per year, right? Which isn't too bad, right? So then if you do that yearly, you don't have to worry about, about this anymore. So all you have to do is pay that, you know, whether it's monthly or yearly. And then in the host site is where you're actually going to go in and um, upload your descriptions, upload your the name of your podcast, your thumbnail, and you only have to do that one time. Once you, you put in all the information into your host site, all you have to do from there is actually submit what's called an RSS feed. It's so like a little link pretty much to these providers, to Spotify, to Apple Podcasts. And uh, once they approve that, it usually takes a few days. Once they approve your podcast, you're good to go. So you only have to do this one time. So really starting your podcast is the time where it's going to be a little bit more turbulent. But as soon as you set up your host site and you submit your RSS feed to Spotify and all the different streaming platforms, from then on, all you have to do is go to your host site and upload your episodes. And once you hit publish, those episodes are automatically uploaded to Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Amazon Music or wherever you want to host your, your episodes. So the host site is key. Once you have that all set up, you're good to go. Um, and then, like we said, a, a podcast editing software. A lot of people use Premiere Pro um, if you have access to the Adobe Suite programs. Um, Audacity is a free program that you can download for free um, off of the internet and use a, a free audio editing software. I know a lot of students that, that I've spoken to have started using Audacity to, you know, just edit different audio, you know, input some, some, um, some theme music, you know, maybe cut out something somebody said, um, and that's free, so you can use that. And then there's, there's obviously different digital audio workspaces like Logic, and, and um, I use uh, Persona Studio 1.3 Artist, you know, but you don't have to get that fancy. So really, a lot of people think you need to get fancy. You don't even need a microphone in an audio box. You know, a lot of the times I tell people, if you just want to record like this, you know, I've seen people start podcasts, you know, just like this through, through your laptop to laptop. All the students that you hear on the podcast aren't using fancy microphones, you know. So if you really just want to get started and jump into it, you can do it straight, straight up like the way that we're doing it now. So it's not as hard as it seems. Um, oh, I'll pass it on over to Andrea for this one. The way that we have structured the, the, the questions for, for the interview part of our uh, project um, is we decided to frame questions. The first questions are gonna be about facts, for example, just demographics, uh, your name, where do you live? When did you take the pictures in the case of our project? How long did it take you to take these pictures? Was it one day? Was it a week, two weeks? Um, so those are facts and then we move on to what the stories. What's the story behind this picture, for example? And allow the person that you're interviewing to develop their ideas, to develop their thoughts. Um, one of the, a tip would be don't talk over um, the person you're interviewing because you're gonna, um, you're gonna limit the, the, the train of thought that they have. And also if you're recording, it's gonna be messy in the recording. So try not to maybe assert or, or let the person that you're interviewing know that you're listening actively, that you're interested, but be quiet uh, while you're interviewing. Then the third part would be you move on to, okay, so these are their stories, this is their experience. What's their, how do they reflect upon those experiences and those stories? 
um, and make the questions uh, open. So you allow them because you don't want yourself to be talking all the time in an interview. You actually, you're just a vehicle. You, you want the other person's voice and the other person's story and, 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 and experience. And then the final one would be the advice. What have you learned from this experience? What can you, from your experience, what can you tell us, the others who have not experienced that, for example? Um, and that's how we have structured our interviews. Yeah, it's been super helpful since since uh, Andrea came on board and we started doing it this way. It's been so helpful to kind of like um, have that structure to get the best stories out of our students or the best reflections out of our students. We also do give, um, you know, we do give ourselves some space to go on some tangents sometimes, you know, I know I, I definitely do, or sometimes the students want to tell us a story that doesn't necessarily align with our structure. And that's okay. Sometimes you don't have to be so rigid. Sometimes with those, um, with those tangents, you know, you get a really good story or a really good reflective note, you know, from the student. So it's, uh, it's good to do that as well, you know, and then you can edit afterwards, edit down um, things that you might not need, or, or maybe weren't as relevant, you know, if you're trying to cut down on time. Another thing that it's important, we don't do this in our in our podcast because neither Enrique nor I are the people that are writing. Um, but one of the things when you're doing, for example, a narrative podcast or even for our students is to tell them the difference between writing and then writing for audio. And it's very, very different because in, in audio, you're just listening. You have no other cues, right? So it's only the sound and the voice. And here we can have, uh, it's an example of how you would write uh, in journalism. For example, in the Associated Press, this is the same story, one from the Associated Press and one from NPR. So Enrique, do you wanna read? So it's not my beautiful accent. Oh, your accent is incredible, um, <laughs> but I will go ahead and read if you'd like me to. Um, so for the Associated Press, it's. Google is creating a new company to oversee its highly lucrative internet business and a growing flock of other ventures, including some like building self-driving cars and researching ways to prolong human life that are known more for their ambition than for turning, than for turning an immediate profit. Um, and then the NPR one is Google is no longer just one company. Yesterday, founder Larry Page announced in a blog post that Google is breaking up into smaller pieces, pieces that can be, in his words, more ambitious. And this new entity has a new name, Alphabet Inc. So as you can see, it's, it's very easy to understand the NPR story versus the one from, from the Associated Press. One of the things that the NPR story is, is doing is using the present tense. So the, the sentences are very, very short, right? Kind of like how we talk. We don't talk in subordinate sentences. Um, we just talk in, 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 in very short sentences and there's a lot of punctuation that allows us to breathe, okay? So that's one of the, of the ways that you write for audio. Yeah, and this will come up later, so keep this in mind. So some of the tips is use the present tense, be visual with your language uh, using the description because the, another, the, the listener is not able to see what you're seeing, for example. Um, one of the things that we try to do with the, with the students is to describe, for example, the surroundings, um, whatever is not in the frame of the picture, right? Describe where you were, how did it look, how did it feel? Um, recently, we had this student who was talking how when she went back to FIU after months and months and months, uh, the, the campus was completely empty and she went to see the turtles. Um, and that's something that you cannot necessarily capture in a picture, right? Because you, it's only a little frame, but there was this emptiness throughout. And that's something that we were able to capture, not through image, but through sound. Um, like I said, use uh, short and simple sentences so the, the person that is listening is able to follow you. Limit to a minimum the use of qualifiers. Don't say really, don't say very, because we don't need necessarily your opinion, but we just need um, to follow you. Um, when you're writing, talk aloud, and that'll help you write as you talk instead of write as you write academic writing. 
Um, and another thing is just be yourself. Don't try to imitate others. Like uh, I know Terry Gross is fabulous, but we are not gonna be able to be Terry Gross or even Roman Mars. Um, so each of us is gonna have our own style. We're all, we're, we're just, we're all gonna have our own tone of voice. Also, you're gonna hate your tone of voice once you hear yourself. And everybody goes through it. And no matter what happens, you're still going to hate it. You just get used to it. Awesome. So now we're going to do an activity. Do you so, think we should ha have questions now or no? We jump into the activity. We um, maybe we do. The How are we on time? Oh, no. Minutes. Activity. Yeah. And then we'll and then we'll we'll have time for for the questions. So um, we're gonna jump into an activity. So like I said, if you have a piece of paper or your phone or anything next to you that you can write on or write with, um, you know, bring that out. So we're gonna do an audio visual storytelling activity. Okay, so we're gonna give you five minutes to pick an image from the Our Stories archive that we're gonna put in the chat um, that speaks to you and, and you can write a reflection on it. So it doesn't have to be long, you know, just a few paragraphs, if you'd like three paragraphs max, so nothing long at all. So you're going to pick an image from the archive from one of our students from the first cohort from summer 2020. We haven't uploaded our, our spring ones yet. Um, and you're going to pick one that speaks to you and maybe it reflects something, an emotion that you felt during summer 2020 or something that you went through, right? So you can just talk about what the image looks like, how it makes you feel, what it makes you think about, right? And write um, a short reflection about that, right? Um, once you do that, like Andrea said, remember short sentences uh, and lots of punctuation so you can breathe. Um, so think of this as like a free writing exercise. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't edit too much, just write what, you, what you're thinking, right? Then the next step after that is that we're gonna give you time to record your reflection using the voice memo app on your phone. OK, so if everyone's got a phone next to them, I, I hope so. Um, you can write you can actually like speak into your phone and uh, and uh, read your reflection that you wrote. Right. So take your time, speak slowly and record, you know, one good take. And then after that, you're going to if you're free, if you want to, you can send it to me and we can share. Um, we can share a, a couple of the reflections that were made right now. And if you do share them, if we get a good amount of, of uh, reflections sent to me, um, I am actually going to stitch them together into like one long reflection from this Miami studies workshop. Right. So if you want to, you know, we would love for you to send over the reflection. So real quickly, I'm going to show you how to do that. So for example, I'm going to share my, my phone screen really quickly. So let's say that, you know, this is your voice recording app, right? So let's say that this is my, my uh, reflection that I just, uh, that I just uh, recorded, right? I'm going to hit the little three dots on the bottom uh, left, right? And then it's going to, it's going to pop up this window and you can click on share. And then from share, you can click messages. And then you can put my phone number here. So 786-333-5745. And then uh, it'll be sent to me. Okay. So if you do that, I'll have your reflection and we'll be able to share with the uh, audience and share with everybody. And then we can sit them together into one big, one big happy Miami studies reflection. Okay. Let me go ahead and share this again. So we'll go ahead and give you all five minutes. Is everyone good to go? Maybe put a, put the, a, put a yes. The pictures. Oh the yeah. The pictures. Here we go. So. Just put it in the chat. Oh, host and, pan host and panelists, hold on. Let me put it for everybody. There you go. So take a look. We picked a few pictures from each one of the students. Uh, pick your favorite one and then write a very short reflection on it, okay? We are. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so I got a few. Let's go ahead and listen to them. Hold on. You got a few? I got a couple. That's fabulous. That's I'm, I'm looking at an image of a highway. Okay, so this is Julio. We'll go ahead and check this one out. Let me just go ahead and upload this one while we're listening to that. Okay, ready? Uh, this is Julio. I'm looking at an image of a highway with a 
an electronic sign that says drive through testing and it's uh it kind of speaks to me for a number of reasons one of the reasons i i find myself really drawn to it is that it really kind of has me think very differently about how um the pandemic really did change different aspects of time and the way that we navigate our everyday lives really thinking about what i assume is a generally pretty populated and pretty congested south florida one that's full of traffic one that's full of of chaos on the streets and here the the road is is you know appears empty um as there's now testing sites for for the covid-19 there's a sign that that you know asks people to yield to bikes um and kind of thinking about all the effects that the pandemic had on so many levels so just on our everyday life on our ability of of health mental health and physical health um but also thinking also a little bit about the environmental aspects of the of the pandemic what did um the changes that came about yield for for climate crisis for you know um all all the kind of things that find themselves very much coming together in in Miami's story and in so many other stories amazing what a what an npr voice right there julio was talking about this image here drive through testing this was taken by alhana camacho our student um who took some amazing images but yeah i i love uh all of the different things you can pull out of that you know even even coming from just the the solidarity of that time but even talking about you know just how clean it is like you mentioned like the side of the road is pretty clean which is typically not the case you know there's a couple pieces of trash here i think right but uh when it comes to climate change and pollution um there was some some unfortunately some positive implications of that time that we were all kind of inside right so yeah that's a great point julio we have a couple more we'll we'll play two more and then we'll we'll take some questions oh man we got another one we had so many we had so many good ones you guys are so great i don't think we'll be able to listen to them all but Let's see. We might only be able to listen to one more. How much has COVID? Okay, so now we got Oren. So this is Oren. Thank you so much for 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 your submission, Oren. Welcome to welcome to the podcast. Okay, this is uh this is Oren. How much has COVID infiltrated your brain? There are certain physical practices that become second nature over time. For me, looking to the right as I enter a house for the mezuzah to touch gently kissing my fingers before I enter. Now, I look at door handles, grocery items, the smooth ones especially, as I encounter them. I wash my hands instinctively every time when I come home. And even people, do I offer to shake a hand? Fist bump? What does she think as I hesitate? Do I say anything? It's the era of corona. And I'm not sure if it will ever end. That was that was that was a almost poetry, Oren. That was incredible. That was so great. Which which image were you were you inspired by there? That was incredible. I'm not sure if I missed that. Okay, let's see. Guess talking about <laughs> if I had to guess. Oh, maybe the 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 handle the handle with the napkin maybe. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Okay, okay. I love that. Well, thank you all so much. We actually got Pioneer also sent one in, but I think we'll we'll take some questions now. We're like literally 1 minute before the end of all of this, but um I'm really I really hope you all had a good time in this workshop and I'll stitch together all the ones that we got and um and uh I'll send them over so you all can hear them all. Um I will. I will we will play them all. I'll send you all like a a, a file that has them all on one one listen. Um but I think we do have a question in the chat also from Warren. So let's see. We'll do this one and then if anyone else has any questions we'll we'll go into that and then we'll wrap up. Right? Or do you, did you want to I think else? I think we should listen to Pioneer. You you got Pioneer and and Laura? And, and Laura, yeah. Let's listen. Okay, let's listen to We the... we got two male voices. Let's hear the female voice. You're very correct. Let's see. I'm pretty sure this is Laura's. I'm looking at the picture of the sunset 
and the sky in this picture looks soft and made up of so many pinpoints of reflected light. The blues and greens at the top of the image are especially reminiscent of pointillism, leading me to feel even more deeply that this image is a painting. It makes it look even more analog. I've often seen sunsets like this in Miami, around home, so I also felt a sense of recognition when staring at this image. The bright but lowering sun shining on the lower clouds remind me that there's hope after COVID, hope after so much loss and emotion and stress that everyone is going through. That was also beautiful. So this was, you were looking at the image of the, of the sunset, sunset. this one. I love the way that you also related it back to abstract, you know, art expressionism. Uh, that's beautiful, which we talk about a lot also in the interviews, just kind of like the the way that their that their images also line up with art, you know, because there, there's some that are super artistic. This one in particular is one of my favorites as well. This one could almost be a painting, I feel. You the know? composition is outstanding in that Yeah, one. definitely. We got we have one more from Pioneer, and then we'll we'll go ahead and wrap up this one. For some reason, it wouldn't let me save to Google Drive. I'll figure that out in a second, but I'll just share it straight from my straight from my phone, so you all can hear it. I'm reflecting on image ending zero zero one three. I see feelings of isolation that have become pervasive across from us. We see a small black dog, still and distant. We see a line of white doors of neighbors shut, creating a barrier of protection from them and from us. And in the foreground, we see one figure with long brown hair and a red t-shirt really the only pop of color in this scene that feels so lonely. Another absolutely beautiful uh, description and uh, reflection. Clearly you all should just be poets. Maybe, you know, instead of, instead of teaching classes, you all can just start being poets, you know? Um, but seriously, thank you all so much. That was incredibly beautiful. This is, you know, one of the reasons I love doing this project so much uh, since Andrea and I started it in summer of 2020. It's been really beautiful hearing people's experiences and the way that they relate back to um, the city, like I said, uh, being from Miami, but just everything that, that students have gone through. And sometimes we forget, you know, even Andrea and I, as we as we went along interviewing people, it, you know, we we forgot just everything that happened that summer or that continues to happen in life. But it's really nice to to have something like this where students can take images, we can have them in some sort of archive for forever and uh, hear about exactly what they were going through and, and, and remember these instances. So we want to say thank you. Um, and we hope that you learned a lot about starting a podcast, podcasting, storytelling, um, when it comes to visual storytelling and auditory storytelling. And like we said earlier, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions whatsoever about anything. You can contact us through the Our Stories website. You can send us an email at our personal emails. Uh, but thank you so much. And I'll, I'll pass it over to Andrea if you want to if you want to sign us off as well. Sign us off. Do you don't want to read the questions? Everybody. Oh, that's needs right. It. Do we have we, two questions on the Q and A? We're gonna go over a little bit. We're already a little over, but we'll we'll answer these and then we'll and then we'll say our goodbyes. So we have one question from Oren. Oren said. Could you say more about the resistance or friction embedded into the project through the unfamiliar medium of film photography, i.e. with having to wait for the images to be developed, the opposite of instant cell phone photography, unlimited number of exposures, et cetera. How did you teach through and or manage student expectations slash frustra frustrations with the aspect of this project? Great question. That is a really good one. Do you, do you, have an, do you wanna answer that, Andrea? I think that's one of the reasons most of the students signed up for the project, actually, because they wanted to have that experience with an actual film camera. They all knew that um, they were going to have to wait to see the pictures. Perhaps what they didn't know was how long it was going to take and the frustration of, of um, not knowing how to use, for example, the, the, um, the flash in the cameras, right? 
But I think Enrique did, you did, um, you told them that they needed to wind down the, the little um, thing. So mm -hmm. what do you think, Enrique? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, I think it's a big part of the project as well, like that aspect of frustration and like maybe not getting exactly what, is, what they expected is kind of something that we actually kind of hoped for, you know, similar to what was going on in life that summer or what happens in life in general, right? That's just part of film photography, which is one of the reasons we we wanted to do it. You know, there's sometimes where the picture comes out incredible um, and there's sometimes that a picture comes out like absolutely terrible and nothing like what you expected. And that's just something you got to roll with, right? And you just have to take it take it as it as it comes. But like Andrea said, we we did have um, we did have training sessions with the students before they started actually before they actually received the cameras, where we talked to them about you know how to how to um, take a proper image, how to get a good exposure, um, you know. And, and to be honest, we it's it's a learning curve even for us. You know, with, with the first cohort, um, a lot of the students didn't use the flash inside, which I forgot to tell them. So with the second cohort, I made I made sure that that was a a a uh, a big stressor that I was like, listen, if you're inside, even if you think that you have enough light, you don't use a flash inside. And a lot of our students in the second cohort got a lot a lot more um, well exposed images. But yeah, th there was frustrations, and it, it was part of it, you know. But they they almost enjoyed that, you know, like the frustrations of like it not being perfect, like Andrea said. And it was interesting seeing a lot of students the way that they coped with with that, like you mentioned, not being able to see their images. We had students that um that we had some students that literally would take a picture and then would sketch what they thought that they got just because they could not could not not see what they captured you know or students that like you know would take the image and they would like uh, create lists of what they had taken over they had taken or taken a duplicate on their phone you know so they they cope they tried to cope with it which which was also interesting to hear in the in the interviews you know how they dealt with that. Another thing that it's, I don't know if it's related, but it, it has been very interesting to me is there the, um, and I think it's it's just generational, um, the inability to take a selfie with the film, with the disposable camera, but then how they have decided to manipulate the system in order to capture themselves uh, on the pictures. Because I don't think, I don't think they, they they can think of pictures without them in the picture, right? So that, to me, that has been one of the most interesting aspects, how, how selfies work and in, in, in that generation in particular. Awesome. And then we have one last question, which I think is the perfect question to end off on. Julio says that uh, he says some very nice things about us. He says, it was incredible. Thank you, Andrea and Enrique. What's next for our stories? So great question. We talked a little bit about this. So we're finishing up the second cohort now. It took us a little bit longer than expected to do all of the interviews because we have double the amount of students in the second cohort. Um, so we're finishing up those. And like I said, it, it's a very interesting juxtaposition for the spring cohort as to the summer cohort because, um, you know, just different times, you know, even a few a few months uh, apart. So the summer cohort, we were in the middle of the pandemic, the spring cohort, people were getting vaccinated and starting to see people again. So there's some really beautiful images and beautiful stories of like, kind of like coming out of that quarantine time. Um, and then after that, we actually already have an idea. So we had been thinking about ways to kind of like expand our stories and think of like different stories that we can tell or ways that we can help different students tell stories. So um, Andrea, you want to tell them about the following thing that we're going to do with Ziana? With Ziana, yeah, we had a student of the of the spring 2021 cohort ask us, she wanted to do to replicate uh, the project um, with uh, a black student association. And and I think I think it's 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 a fabulous idea uh, to see where they take this project, um, how do they implement it, how do they uh, position themselves and their own uh, perspective in many many ways. So I think I think it's just it's and it has happened so organically that I think it's the right thing to do. One of the things that I I would like to remind everyone is that this is a digital archive. And perhaps you, as the as the fellows in the from the Miami Study Certificate, uh, would like to use this for your classes, for example. Um, uh, 
uh, like, like we were using them right now for, for this particular exercise. But make use of, of the pictures, make use of, the, of, the, of their stories and, and maybe tell people that we are collecting these stories and it, we will continue to collect them through the WPHL. Awesome, and with that, we will leave you. I hope you have a good rest of your day and thank you all so much for coming and I hope you, you learned a lot today.